Uh, let us pray as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings and your goodness to us, and uh, we thank you for the opportunity of being together, and um, we just ask for you to be our teacher and help us to learn, uh, learn the things that we need to, and as we look at the topic of high blood pressure and its reversal from a natural standpoint, uh, just continue to be with us, guide us, and lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so looking at reversing high blood pressure naturally, and, uh, and looking at this, we need to understand what high blood pressure is in the first place and the whole system in which it develops. And uh, it's helpful to keep in mind that the cardiovascular system is a hydraulic system. It's a, it's a system with a pump, a fluid, with pipes, with valves, and that dysfunction of any of these components can negatively impact the function of the system as a whole. And so you can have fluid problems, you can have uh, pi pipe problems, you can have pump problems, um, you can have valve problems, all of those can uh, lead to problems with uh, the pressure of the fluid that's going through that system. But not only that, it's not just a simple hydraulic system. We have uh, a, a finely tuned uh, interplay of complex neurological and hormone uh, sensors and regulators that control blood pressure on a small scale and a large scale. Um, and uh, and that the, so that those delicate organs in the body can be correctly supplied with blood under the various environmental challenges that they're going through. And, and, and so there's a lot of regulation of blood pressure, and that regulation of blood pressure happens very quickly, and it's happening all the time. Uh, in fact, if you went in and you measured your blood pressure, um, and then we went back and we measured your blood pressure a minute or two later, it's going to be slightly different. If it wasn't different, it means uh, typically that the device that you're using isn't terribly accurate, and so there's some of those variations that the device is not picking up. But if you have like an arterial line and where we can measure your blood pressure constantly, uh, every second we know what your blood pressure is. We see that that blood pressure fluctuates and varies moment by moment, even when an individual is just lying still or sleeping or on a ventilator or, or so on. And uh, so there's this constant uh, <coughs> manipulation of uh, blood pressure uh, so that you can have proper blood flow to the various tissues of the body as is needed. And there are a number of factors that are known to be associated with high blood pressure. Uh, those include your gender, um, stress, genetic factors, uh, activation of your, your fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, increased cardiac output, uh, retention of salt or sodium, uh, obesity, alcohol intake, the function of your endocrine system, the age of an individual. Uh, all of these are factors that uh, are known to be associated with or contributing factors to high blood pressure. And while age may be considered a risk factor for high blood pressure, there are certain populations that have no elevation of blood pressure over their lifetime. So individuals in their 70s have the same uh, blood pressure as individuals that are 17. And, um, and, and in those populations that are like that, they have very low salt intake over their lifetime. And so it appears to be that age is only a risk factor because it provides more time for an individual to be exposed to things other things than just age that then causes the blood pressure to increase over time. For example, it gives you more and more years to be exposed to excess salt and then excess salt and its impact upon high blood pressure. We also know that uh, alcohol intake leads to high blood pressure um, and the mechanism that it does that is you're still working on that mechanism. Um, and seeking to understand that, but alcohol intake also increases blood pressure over time, not just with a single drink per se, but as an individual continues to drink, then it does increase blood pressure. Well, then what about that and the recommendations for heart health for wine intake? 
Well, it's not the alcohol in the, in the drink that is beneficial to the heart. In fact, we learn even just in basic sciences and medical school that, that alcohol is cardiotoxic. It's not the alcohol that's beneficial, it's the resveratrol um, and the other phytonutrients that are in uh, the grape, especially the skin of the grape and the seeds of the grape and so on. And that if an individual is uh, drinking a grape-based product, then it does have beneficial uh, effects on the cardiovascular system and to certain degrees despite the negative effects that the alcohol has on the cardiovascular system. Of course for women uh, they recommend that at least a drink of uh, wine a day but a drink of wine a day is just the amount that you need to double your risk for breast cancer so choose your, de your, your death, right? Um, it would be better for you to be consuming like Welch's grape juice than for an alcoholic uh, beverage. Uh, chronic kidney disease, that's another factor related to high blood pressure. When an individual has uh, kidney disease, it leads to retention of fluids, so you're not getting rid of the excess fluid. So the more fluid you have in the system, the more pressure that it's going to have. And um, it increases, also leads to increased vascular resistance. So those blood vessels in response to uh, kidney disease start to clamp down on the blood inside of it. And both of those contribute to high blood pressure. And of course, high blood pressure is the second leading cause, at least in the United States, of chronic kidney disease. So it's interesting because the high blood pressure can lead to kidney failure and the kidney failure can lead to high blood pressure. And so if you had high blood pressure leading to kidney failure and the kidney failure then contributes to more high blood pressure, then you start to see this trend where an individual as their kidneys start failing, their blood pressures keep going up and up. Uh, and it becomes harder and harder to keep those blood pressures under control. There are certain illegal drugs also like cocaine and amphetamines that increase blood pressure and can also cause heart attacks and death from its use. And uh, those are mediated through uh, certain mechanisms, um, increasing the amount of your sympathetic nervous system discharge, so your fight or flight response, um, increased cardiac output, so the pump is pumping harder, and so that's going to increase the, the blood pressure as well. There are many legal drugs that also are known to increase blood pressure. Uh, Tylenol or maybe, um, maybe in your location it might be paracetamol. Right, that's the, that's, uh, um, that's the, the British equivalent of, of Tylenol or acetaminophen. Um, and so there, there's tyl Tylenol or, or uh, paracetamol. There's NSAIDs like Motrin and Aleve and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. All of those lead to higher blood pressures. Uh, cold and cough medications. And those do so uh, quite significantly. And so somebody that has high blood pressure, they really want to look at avoiding those cold and cough medications because they can significantly increase blood pressure. Nasal decongestants, uh, birth control pills, and other forms of um, estrogen administration, testosterone, uh, antidepressants, steroids, uh, angiogenesis inhibitors, that would be for uh, cancer. Uh, to prevent blood vessel growth into the tumor, migraine medications, performance enhancing drugs, so uh, like for, for athletics and so on, and caffeine. Right? All of these are legalized drugs that are known to have a, an impact on increasing one's blood pressure. And so if you're on those medications, then you can, uh, you can then not be surprised if you develop high blood pressure while you're on that. There's also genetics that can be a, a contributing factor to high blood pressure by uh, causing a dysfunction or a dysregulation in a number of the steps in the process of blood pressure regulation. And so uh, I'm not going to go over any specifics from that standpoint because it's really complex. And a lot of it I don't even understand myself. I would have to do a lot more study um, <coughs> in it. But Genetics can play a role. Hyperthyroidism, so an individual that has an overactive thyroid, a lot of times that can lead to high blood pressure because the thyroid uh, releases uh, thyroid hormone, thyroxin, and that thyroxin has a strong uh, impact upon metabolism, heart rate, uh, and, and so on. And it increases also vascular resistance, so the blood vessels clamping down on 
on the blood inside of it. It increases heart rate, increases cardiac output, so the pump is pumping harder, and so all of that leads to increased blood pressure. We also know that overweight and obesity is a major contributing factor to high blood pressure. Uh, and there are reasons for that. One of, the, one of the reasons for that is this hormone called leptin. You see your, your fat tissue, the adipose tissue, it produces uh, a number of different things. It doesn't just hold fat, but it, it, it's an active tissue. It produces hormones and so on. And leptin is one of its SOS hormones, one of its, uh, let's save this ship, um, hormones. And, and uh, the, the fat cells, when fat increases, it increases typically by the size of the cells getting bigger. Many other tissues, it increases, the tissue increases in size because it just replicates and there's more and more of the cells that are there in the tissue. But fat tissue typically grows by just increasing the size of the cells themselves. And since they are pretty much storage units for triglycerides, fat, um, then those storage units just get bigger and bigger as you have more and more of those triglycerides or more and more of that fat inside those cells. And the bigger they get, uh, the more complex it becomes or more difficult it becomes to control all of the functions that happen inside the cell and cell communication and so on. And, and so one of the cellular responses to those cells getting too big is releasing hormones that then have an impact upon metabolism and appetite and so on. And leptin is one of those hormones. And leptin, the more leptin you have, the more likely you're going to feel full sooner at a meal, the higher your metabolic rate will be, and also the higher your blood pressure will be because it stimulates the hypothalamus in the brain and uh, causes an increase of your fight or flight response. And one of the parts of that fight or flight response is to increase the blood pressure. And uh, unfortunately, when leptin is around for a while, uh, it stops causing you to feel full earlier. So you get over that part of it. Uh, it stops increasing your metabolic rate after a while. So you get over that as well, but it doesn't stop increasing the blood pressure. So unfortunately, you don't get over that one. And so as an individual's weight gets more and more, typically the blood pressure starts going up. And uh, for individuals that are overweight and obese, this gives us a, a perfect thing to work on when it comes to blood pressure reduction. One of the things that you need to do is lose weight. That's right. So as you lose the weight, as you lose the fat, the, uh, the leptin production decreases and its impact upon high blood pressure. Physical inactivity is another uh, cause for high blood pressure. Uh, the less active you are, uh, the less well the, the, the blood is going to circulate through the system. Um, there is increased uh, sensitivity to, um, to stress hormones. Uh, in the body of an individual who has not been exercising on a regular basis. And those stress hormones also have an impact upon blood pressure. And so blood pressure tends to be elevated more so in individuals that are physically inactive. Salt, excess salt over a prolonged period of time of years is another known contributing factor to high blood pressure. And there are several mechanisms in the kidneys themselves that have been identified over the last several years that, that show how the salt dysregulates the kidney and the kidney function and its production of urine and its retention of uh, fluid and so on so that it, it causes then that excess salt intake causes a kidney dysfunction which then results in higher blood pressures in individuals over the years. And again, this is probably one of the major causes for the increase in blood pressure as an individual ages, because most of us live in a society where we have too much salt intake over a prolonged period of time, and our blood pressures tend to increase as we age. And it's probably most likely because of the excess salt intake over those years. Smoking. Uh, nicotine is also a stimulant which increases the, the force of the contraction of the heart. It also causes vasoconstriction to clamp down on those blood vessels and uh, has a number of effects on increasing blood pressure. It also accelerates heart disease. It uh, is a contributing factor to many different cancers and so on. 
Uh, it's not a healthy thing to be involved in, and it's not healthy to be around those that are smoking as well, because there are uh, tens of thousands of individuals in the United States every year that die from secondhand smoke exposure. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not healthy to be around those who are smoking like that. Sleep apnea is another cause for high blood pressure. Uh, we're not sure exactly the patho pathologic mechanisms that are there. Uh, I can imagine what some of them are. Sleep apnea is a situation where you stop breathing for periods of time at night. Uh, typically, it's obstructive sleep apnea, and that's usually because of excess weight and that excess weight on the throat, then pushing the throat back and causing an individual's throat, their airway to close off while they're sleeping uh, soundly at night or sleeping in my lecture right now. And uh, I'm not saying anything. Um, and uh, just as long as you don't snore really loud. Um, and and that, uh, that, uh, that weight pushing back there and stopping breathing, and an individual has to stop breathing for at least 20 minutes at a time officially to be uh, sleep apnea, and that usually happens hundreds of times at night. So you can imagine if somebody strangled you at night and, uh, and they suffocated you for 20 seconds or longer each time, and then you, you, you catch your breath back and and then it happens again, and you catch your breath back, and it happens again, and you catch your breath back, and, and so on, um, that when that happens repetitively, you can imagine that there's probably a lot of um, stress response that happens even at night. And, and that stress response can have an impact on blood pressure, and indeed, individuals who have sleep apnea, they tend to then develop higher blood pressures, and when you treat the sleep apnea, the blood pressures tend to improve. Right? Not necessarily go away entirely because individuals that have sleep apnea tend to be individuals that are overweight and obese as well, and so there's that contributing factor as well. Stress. Stress is another um, factor that relates to high blood pressure as well, and uh, there can be uh, there can be stress as far as one's occupation is concerned. Um, so you can have work-related stress. You can have marriage-related stress. You can have uh, social isolation, so feeling loneliness and so on, uh, low e socioeconomic status, and even racial discrimination. All of those have been are factors of social stresses and so on that have been shown to be associated with higher blood pressures. Uh, and it's, it can be a bit more specific than that. We've had, of course, the experience here at our Lifestyle Center of many individuals coming with high blood pressure. And sometimes you're doing everything for them, and, and their blood pressure is just not coming down, not coming down, not coming down. And, uh, and it's a problem. And, and then you, you start talking with them about their life and, and stuff that's going on, and you find out that, oh, there's this issue that you never told anybody about, and there's this thing that you've been holding on to, and there's that thing that you did. And you, you know, so there's guilt, and there's bitterness, and there's resentment, and there's all of these different types of things that are going on. And when those things are addressed and dealt with and, and removed, then it's, it's, it's just neat to watch somebody's blood pressure start coming down um, after that is done. So there are definitely issues of the mind that can lead to high blood pressure. Now, blood pressure usually has two numbers. Of course, you have the top number, which is called the systolic, uh, and the bottom number, which is the diastolic. The systolic represents the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart is contracting maximally. So the greatest force that that, pressure, that that blood gets to when the heart is beating. And the diastolic pressure is the pressure that's left over when the heart is at its maximum rest. And uh, that diastolic pressure represents how much compression is on the blood because of the elastic nature and the blood vessels, uh, the, the muscular nature of the blood vessels. And it continues to put pressure on that blood even when the heart is not pumping. Right? Um, and in fact, with, when an individual dies, um, or goes to sleep in this lecture, um, when, when an individual dies, um, it, their blood pressure doesn't go to zero right away. It takes a while for, for those, those muscles in the, in the blood vessels to eventually run out of oxygen and nutrients and so on, and then finally relax, 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 and an individual will finally get to zero. Um, but it doesn't go there right away, or unless they bleed out, and then they don't have any more stuff in the blood vessels. Um, so normal blood, blood pressure is uh, less than 120 over 80, uh, under le over less than 80. 
Right, that's where normal should be. So you should be in the one teens or below, and you should be in the 70s or below as far as uh, normal blood pressure is concerned. If your blood pressure is elevated, then it's gonna be, it's gonna be in the 120s and still below 80s. And officially now, and then of course the criteria changed, I think it was 2017, I think, late 2017 is when they came out with the new blood pressure criteria, um, if I'm correct. Um, high blood pressure stage one is 130s over 80s, and then stage two is at least 140 over at least 90. This is your official criteria for diagnosing blood pressure issues. Uh, and so if you had a blood pressure of 125 over 79 and you thought that you were doing good, well, just recognize that 125 over 79 is still considered to be uh, elevated. And the, the studies, and there are lots and lots of studies on high blood pressure, the studies indicate that if you maintain in that range, that over a long period of time, we're talking multiple years into decades, that there are physical effects that can be seen in the organs related to high blood pressure and, uh, and, and those negative effects that are happening even when somebody is in that range. And so that's, that's one reason why they changed the criteria because it used to be that somebody would say, well, your blood pressure needs to be at least 140 over 90 for you to have high blood pressure. Well, that was the old criteria, but there's more and more studies showing that even in those lower numbers, if you maintain those blood pressures in the 130s or the, the 120s or so on, and over 80s or uh, 70s and so on, that, that if you maintain that over a long period of time, over decades, that there are still the negative consequences of high blood pressure that is seen in individuals. And really, the lower we get it, the better. So if you can be 100 over, over 50, great. Right. If you're in the one teens, you're probably okay. And if you're, um, uh, if you're at least below 80, then that's good, and if that could be down into the 60s, that would be even better, right? So the lower we can go, the better it is for us when it comes to uh, high blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure is ca called the silent killer. Why? Well, it's because it doesn't have any typical symptoms associated with it. You can have high blood pressure and feel just fine and not have an, a, a clue that you have it. And it can be there for years and you feel just fine and, there's, and you have no clue that there's anything with it. And that's one reason why when you go to see your doctor, your care provider, that they will usually take your blood pressure and see what it's like because, well, everybody is susceptible to it and so many people have it and many people don't realize that they have it. So we wanna pick it up early before it becomes a real problem because there are all sorts of consequences associated with high blood pressure. And you can have problems with uh, strokes, you can have problems with heart attacks, you can have problems with uh, heart failure, you can have problems with uh, your eyes and blindness, you can have kidney failure, um, you can uh, even, the research has shown that high blood pressure actually is a contributing factor to diabetes and the development of diabetes and of course diabetes uh, is, is a contributing factor to cardiovascular disease and so they all seem to feed into each other. Of course, a lot of the same things that cause one disease causes the others as well. And, uh, and so there's all sorts of negative effects associated with high blood pressure. And so you do want to catch it. You do want to keep it under control. And, uh, and sometimes individuals think uh, when they come here to UG Pines as a guest at the Lifestyle Center, they think, well, we're going to fix everybody's blood pressure and we're going to fix them all on a natural basis. And they had blood pressure medication when they were at home and they didn't bring it with it, uh, didn't bring the medication with them because we're just gonna deal with everything on a natural basis. Well, we do attempt to do things on a natural basis, but um, you know, if you come here and you were on medication, you came off of your medication, and now you're running 180s, 190s, 200, 210, you know, other things like that, we're not comfortable with that, and we don't want you, we don't want your head to go <laughs> right? Not interested in that. 
And, and, and so, uh, you know, many times we will work with your medications and natural remedies and so on at the same time to look at getting your blood pressures down into a, into a very good range. And then once it's in a good range, then look at starting to come back on, uh, you know, backing off of the medication and, and so on. Right. So if you ever plan on coming to UT Pines, bring your medications with you. Uh, we'll help you. Uh, uh, look at those and see which ones are, are good ones to let go of now or which ones we need to keep and hold on to for a while. Um, so that's just kind of a brief overview about blood pressure, but what do we do about it? What are the steps that we can take in order to help to overcome blood pressure on a natural basis? One of those is fasting, right? Uh, fasting for several days, uh, drinking only water, and uh, water or some of the herbal teas that are listed below, but not with sugar, not with sh you know, sweeteners, not with honey, and so on. Uh, basically a calorie-free uh, fasting. And in our uh, almost 50 years of experience here at UT Pines, we found that blood pressures decrease quite quickly in someone who's fasting. Typically, there are some individuals that don't, but in the majority of individuals, their blood pressures tend to come down while they're fasting. And um, there are studies that show that there can be reductions as great as 60 points uh, systolic and 17 points uh, diastolic in those with blood pressures that are over 180 over 110 um, with just uh, medically supervised fasting. So some significant blood pressure reductions just with medically supervised fasting. And, uh, and Jerry, he, he came to us, that's not his name and this is not his picture, but uh, it reminds me of him, so I uh, put it on there. Anyways, Jerry came to us, I don't know, it's probably six, six and a half years ago now. Mm, yeah, somewhere around there. And, and I took care of Jerry. And he came to us, his blood pressures were running in the 180s to 200 or so, and he was running in the mid to upper 90s to around 110 as far as his diastolic. And he, he was exercising on a daily basis. He was eating a, a, a plant-based diet. Diet. I wouldn't call it a whole food plant-based diet, but anyways, he was a vegetarian, and he had been doing a lot of the things that he thought he should to, should to try to get his blood pressure under control. He had even purchased Dr. Agatha's uh, book on high blood pressure and was following things in there, but it just wasn't it wasn't getting under control. So finally, he came to UT Pines, and 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 so uh, we not unfrequently will start individuals on a fast, a three-day fast, and. And uh, because there's lots of benefits associated with it, and I think Dr. Sanchez is going to be talking about fasting and its benefits tomorrow or the next day, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so, so, um, so he did, he came, and every day his blood pressure dropped by about five or ten points. And you could see it every day, it was, it was dropping fairly consistently. And so at three days, when it was time for him to start eating again, he said, can I continue fasting? And it's rare that we ever get that request, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, so I said, sure, go for it. And so um, both of our recollections were not in line with each other because when I talked to him later, he thought that he fasted for six days. I thought he had fasted for 11 days. Um, but anyway, so he fasted for it, at least six days, you know, close to a week. And by the time he got done with his fast, his blood pressures were in the 120s over 70 or so. And then he started eating again. And of course, it was healthy eating and, you know, lots of greens and other things like that. But his blood pressures then ranged between the 120s to 140 or so uh, over 70s and 80s, which is much better than what he came with at the beginning, right? And, um, and, and so that was an interesting experience that we had with him. And of course, there are studies that show that fasting helps to bring blood pressure levels down. But fasting is not a sustainable treatment for blood pressure, right? Just letting you know that. It's not sustainable uh, treatment for blood pressure. Uh, one that is sustainable is a diet that is low in sodium, right? Low salt diets are uh, beneficial for, for high blood pressure. And how low does it need to be? Well, you're looking at consuming less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day, of, uh, a day, and what does that look like from a salt content? Well, that's less than three quarters of a teaspoon. Right? Less than three quarters of a teaspoon of salt for the day. And that's in all the foods that you consume. Right? All the foods that you consume, less than three quarters of a teaspoon a day. Uh, what are some of the major sources of salt in uh, a Western diet? Well, 
that's that bottom right corner right there. Uh, cheese is a major source. Soups are a major source. Uh, uh, sandwich uh, slices, deli slices, and other things like that. Uh, that's a major source. Uh, pizza is a major source in the American diet. And the number one source of sodium in the, in the Western diet? Breads. Breads. Yeah, breads and pastries. Um, so breads in, actually end up in the American diet to be the largest sodium intake um, of any single food item. Um, and a lot of the breads taste really tasty. You know, you go to Panera and other places like that, and they've got all these nice specialty breads, and you can eat a whole bread bowl and, and so on. And that's the bread, and you, you're like, oh, I could just eat this bread alone without having all the toppings on top of it. Well, one of the reasons that you can eat that bread alone without all the toppings on top of it is because of all the salt that's in it. Right? So there's, there's a few things that make things really tasty, right? Salt, fat, and sugar. And, uh, and the sweet spot is figuring out just the right combination of salt, fat, and sugar to just bring that perfect mmm out of it, right? And, uh, and, and you know that mmm when you taste it, you know? Um, just recognize when you taste that mmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> just realize that mmm -hmm -hmm is causing your blood pressure to go mmm, -hmm -hmm, right? <coughs> um, and uh, eating out, eating out is, is kind of a dangerous thing when it comes to sodium. Uh, a lot of, well, it, there is evidence that it, the same meal that you would eat at home, if you ate it in the restaurant, you would have at least twice the amount of sodium or salt content in that meal eaten at a restaurant than you would at home. Uh, because, of course, uh, they want you to come back, and one of the reasons that you come back is because you like the taste of the things, and so you got to make them nice and tasty. Um, of course, eating less salt, putting less salt on your food, but it's really the food preparation that's a really big thing when it comes to salt intake. Um, if you're putting a lot of salt in the food, in the preparation in the first place, and then you're consuming that food, then that's going to be a major uh, component there. And then, of course, meats, uh, flesh foods. One of the major electrolytes inside of the cells is sodium. And that's cellular biology, right? It's, you have a, a major concentration of sodium inside of the inside of the cells, and you're not just going to remove that sodium, and in fact, a lot of meats in their preservation process, you add more salt to it, and for chicken, um, in order to make chicken and uh, chicken legs and chicken breast and other things like that taste healthier, then they usually infuse it with a saline solution as well uh, in order to make it tastier. And so a lot of the chicken that individuals eat is not just the native sodium that's there, but then uh, there's more sodium that's infused into it to try to make it tastier. And then you add all the stuff to the outside of it, and, and it's just chaos. Right? Um, and, uh, and then, of course, oriental foods. You can... You can eat a single meal in an oriental restaurant with uh, lots of salt, and you can end up with about four days' worth of salt intake in a single meal. Right. Um, so those are things to watch out. Uh, Reggie, he came to us with high blood pressure and kidney failure and obesity, um, and uh, his, uh, his uh, blood pressure while he was with us, and this was the first time he was here, I was not here at Uchi Pines yet, I took care of him the second time that he came, and so hence I know his story. And uh, so the first time that he came, and this is what he related to me, he was here at Uchi Pines, and his blood pressure was not coming down at all. And his kidney failure looked like it got a little bit worse between the first and second blood draw. The reason for that is one of the main things that we look at is creatinine, and then the calculation of a glomerular filtration rate based upon creatinine. Well, creatinine is a muscle protein. And uh, so it's inside the muscles, and when you exercise more, well, you have more muscle breakdown, especially if you're exercising more than you're used to. And so then you have more of that creatinine that gets spilled into the bloodstream, and it looks like the kidney function is less, but it's actually not. Um, but anyways, it looked like his kidney function was getting worse while he was with us. His blood pressure didn't come down. He did lose weight. But uh, he was instructed to go home and just continue with the program and, uh, and give it time. So he did. He continued with the program. He continued losing weight. And uh, eventually he lost 100 pounds. And his blood pressure, he said that it took about three months. And then his blood pressure started coming down. And it got down into a really good range. And he had, 
Oh, I don't remember what his creatinine was. It was probably around three or so, which is bad. It's a bad place to be. And, um, and his creatinine levels came back into normal. So his kidney function normalized. His blood pressure eventually came down. He lost 100 pounds and so on. And then I saw him later because he thought, woohoo, life is great. I can go back to doing what I was doing before. <laughs> and when he started going back to what he was doing before, guess what? Everything came back. That's right. And so I saw him again with kidney failure and obesity and high blood pressure. And so um, we were working on that with him again. But just recognize uh, if you do something really well and it reverses the problem, don't go back to the stuff that you were doing before because it's much harder to, to get things resolved afterwards and sometimes impossible. You know? especially when it comes to cancer. Some individuals, they've done like really good with their life and their lifestyle and their diets and exercise and all that kind of stuff, and they get the idea that they've gotten this cancer whooped. <coughs> and then they start going back to some of, you know, they start relaxing and going back to some of the other stuff and that they were doing before. And when the cancer comes back, it comes back with a vengeance. And that second time around is almost impossible to to get it uh, turned around. So uh, when you do healthy, do healthy and stay with healthy. It's, it's good to do so. Uh, a third step that you can do to help with high blood pressure is just maintain a high potassium to sodium ratio. Potassium tends to, uh, to cause blood vessels to dilate, whereas sodium tends to cause them to constrict and, and affect the, the, um, the kidneys and increase blood pressure. So the more potassium that you can have in the diet and the less sodium, usually the better it is for you for high blood pressure. So what are things that have high potassium and have low sodium? Well, things like nuts and seeds. Uh, legumes, uh, looking at the profile, soy actually is the best one as far as its potassium to sodium ratio of the different legumes. Dried fruits are good from that standpoint. Whole grains like um, uh, brown rice and quinoa and corn and kamut and so on. Um, fruits, mushrooms, lamb's quarters, which are those nice greens up there in the the middle right, if you've ever been to Britain, and it's, it's, it's a little bit more popular over on that side of the, the uh, Atlantic than it is on this side, but lamb's quarters of the greens has the highest sodium, I mean, potassium to sodium ratio. And then things like squashes and potatoes are really good sources as well. Uh, you'll notice that the things that have high potassium to sodium ratio, they all belong to what kingdom? Plant. The plant kingdom, that's right. Um, and then if we were to throw the animal kingdom on there, guess what? Yeah, it'd switch. Uh, so it's high sodium and it tends to be much lower potassium. So like your, your blood levels, right? well, we'll go over those on Thursday, but you'll notice that your sodium levels should be between uh, 135 to 145 millicolons per deciliter, but your potassium levels are only, sh only should be around, around three, uh, three to five, five and a half or so. So you have significantly more sodium than you do potassium in an animal content. Uh, step number four, you can use different foods that have been shown to re help reduce blood pressure. One of those is black seed or black cumin seed. Uh, there are studies showing that it helps to reduce blood pressure as you use that on a regular basis. It should be freshly ground uh, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. If you eat it without grinding it, then you don't get much out of it. Um, because it has a nice hole or shell on the outside of it, and if you don't get through that shell or that hole, it's going to come through hole out the other end. Um, so it should be freshly ground. Blonde psyllium as well. Psyllium um, uh, is uh, a, a prominent component in uh, bulking agents to help individuals to be regular. Uh, but that blonde psyllium has been shown to be beneficial in helping reduce blood pressure as well. Flaxseed. Uh, two tablespoons of freshly, freshly ground flaxseed every day. Um, and uh, it takes some time. It takes about two months or so before it starts really kicking in and you start seeing the effect on blood pressure. And then about six months is when it hits its maximum effect. So this is something that you do on a long-term basis is just having flaxseed freshly ground every day two tablespoons, and, uh, and the studies have shown reductions in blood pressure of around 11 to 15 points, which is enough to actually classify it as a drug to treat blood pressure, but, well, nobody's going to make money off of flax, so nobody's going to make it into a drug. <coughs> 
Uh, garlic also has been shown to reduce blood pressure. It's modest reductions. Looking at uh, garlic intake, you're only looking at about uh, two to four points drop in blood pressure. Um, but if the entire population of the United States were to eat enough garlic to drop blood pressure by two to four points, you would actually save over 100,000 people from death every year. So that would be, like, worth it, right? And you might be one of those, and that would be worth it to you. Uh, olives. Olives have been shown to reduce blood pressure as well, so consuming olives. Now, most olives are, are sent to you in brine, so they're nice and salty. So one of the things that you can do is take them out and then just soak them, wash them and soak them for a while so that some of that salt uh, content can be removed uh, from it. But again, olive consumption has been shown to reduce blood pressure and wheat bran. Um, and so wheat bran, bran and blonde psyllium, both of which are basically just fiber, uh, gives us an idea that fiber content has a good uh, effect on blood pressure and blood pressure reduction. Step number five, you can use blood pressure reducing supplements. So there are a number of supplements that help with blood pressure, and those include the things that have studies, coenzyme Q10, folic acid, guar gum, and L-arginine. Uh, CoQ10 is, a, uh, is a, it's also called ubiquinol, um, and it is a part of your Krebs cycle. I don't know if you remember that painful thing you had to memorize in biology and, and, and so on about this molecule going to that one, to that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and you have about 32 ATPs uh, that are produced because of that whole cycle and glucose going in and ATP and NADPH and other things going out the other side. Anyways, I, I ugh, you know, those are painful memories. But anyways, CoQ10 is actually one of those one of those molecules along the way along that chain, and uh, and it's necessary for energy production in the cells. It's actually a very potent antioxidant as well, um, and uh, there are some studies showing that CoQ10 uh, intake is uh, beneficial for uh, high blood pressure. By the way, if you are on a cholesterol medication, a statin cholesterol medication, statin medications are known to deplete CoQ10. And so if you are on a statin medication, make sure that you are supplementing with CoQ10. Right. Make sure that you're supplementing with CoQ10 if you are on a statin medication. Um, that should be done in, in conjunction. Uh, it's standard practice in, in Canada. It has not caught on here in the States. I don't know why. And many other places of the world. Uh, folic acid. So that's uh, vitamin B9. So uh, increased consumption of folic acid has been shown to uh, improve blood pressure. Guar gum is a resin that comes from, um, from a particular tree and it can be powderized and used as a thickener and, and so on. Um, so guar gum has been shown that as well. Then L-arginine, that's an amino acid, uh, one of the amino acids. And that one is one that the, uh, the endothelium, the inside lining of the, of the blood vessels, especially the arteries, uh, the endothelium can produce a substance called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, some of you might know it as laughing gas, um, but nitric oxide inside the blood vessels is probably the most potent vasodilator, cause those blood vessels to dilate so that you can uh, decrease your blood pressure. Well, it in that production of nitric oxide, L-arginine is one of the products that those endothelium cells uh, use to produce nitric oxide. So the more uh, L-arginine that, that you can supply then to a degree, the, the more nitric oxide production and the more vasodilation and the decrease in blood pressure. Uh, there are a couple of herbs that have been shown uh, definitely to help with blood pressure. One of those is hibiscus. And, and uh, many of you live in an area where hibiscus grows. It might even be a weed in your, <laughs> a beautiful one, right? Um, but it, uh, it hedges and so on and so forth that you can have there, there in the Bahamas and the islands and other places. We, uh, it's a little cool for it to grow here. Florida has plenty of um, hibiscus and, and so on. But anyways, it, it's the flower. You just get the flower, you can eat the flower, right? Uh, the, the hibiscus is edible. And as a kid, sometimes I would, you know, pick and then you'd suck off the back end of it because it has a little bit of that sweet uh, nectar that's in there. But you can eat the whole flower, 
You don't have to eat it. What you can do is you can dry it and then you can make it into a tea. You can boil it and make a tea out of it. Um, and uh, so hibiscus has definitely been shown to help with blood pressure. So if that's something you have around you, use it. Right? The studies are they're good studies looking at hibis hibiscus. It's just after you consume it or after you drink it, it's a bit acidic. So you want to rinse your mouth out with some water afterwards so that it doesn't keep eating away at the enamel on the teeth. Um, and then olive leaves. So not only all the, are the olives good for blood pressure reduction, but the leaves of the olive plants are good as well. And so you can use that as well as a tea um, and, and uh, drinking olive leaf tea uh, or uh, using an olive leaf uh, supplement um, to help out with blood pressure reduction. Step number seven, exercise, exercise. Let us get our exercise. Right, so since physical inactivity is associated with higher blood pressures, well, exercise helps to reduce it. Even though while you're exercising, your blood pressure does tend to go up, uh, especially that diastolic number. That lower number tends to go up by five or so points when one is exercising. But after exercise, then an individual then experiences a prolonged reduction in that blood pressure. And so the more physical activity that you get on a regular basis, the more it's going to help with blood pressure and blood pressure reduction. Now, we don't know all of the mechanisms that are in play with blood pressure reduction with, with physical activity, but we know that it's there. And it's something that we should be involved in. And it doesn't have to be complex. It can be simple things like walking right? or, or gardening. Uh, it can be things like weightlifting or, or uh, um, uh, rebounding. It can be hiking, biking, swimming, whatever. Right? Uh, more physical activity on a regular basis, getting that heart rate up and, and so on, that helps, to, uh, helps with that blood pressure. Step number eight, we want to avoid alcohol and tobacco. Those things are known to contribute to high blood pressure. And then, of course, in one of the other slides, we saw that uh, prescription, medication, prescription drugs or legal drugs, including caffeine, uh, contribute to that as well. So avoiding the alcohol, avoiding ta tobacco, avoiding the caffeine, uh, those are things that can help out with blood pressure because if those are things that cause it, remove the cause. <coughs> remove the cause and uh, that will help out with uh, blood pressure as well. Step number nine, you want to lose weight. Right? We talked about this before, those fat cells that produce leptin that cause an increase in blood pressure. Then as you decrease the amount of fat that you have, then that's going to decrease the amount of leptin that those fat cells produce and that's going to decrease the stimulation of your fight or flight response and then that's going to decrease the blood pressure. And indeed most individuals who lose weight, their blood pressure start coming down as they're losing weight. Um, and uh, there are rare individuals out there that have a genetic variation where they don't have receptors in the hypothalamus to leptin. And for those individuals, they can get big, 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 big and their blood pressure doesn't go up when they're getting big. Because even though the fat cells are producing leptin, 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 but they don't have the receptors in the hypothalamus in order for the leptin to actually affect the hypothalamus and your fight or flight response and, and so on, which is another reason why they realize that leptin, it really is the, the, probably the big communicating factor between overweight and obesity and high blood pressure. Right? That, that vehicle by which it happens. Um, so weight loss is really important. And how do you lose weight? Um, fasting. Oh, hey, let's see. Step one was fasting. Step two was a, a, uh, a, a low sodium diet, right? And when you get to low sodium, and then you go to step three, which is a high potassium to low sodium, uh, ratio and you find out that that's in plants and then you look at the different types of foods that help to reduce blood pressure. Wow, they're all plant foods and they have uh, lots of fiber and so on. So when you start doing all of these other things, well, then that starts helping out with the weight too. Right? So just following those other, other steps, they tend to be low calorie, uh, tend to be high fiber, lots of uh, water content in the foods. And the more of those foods that you eat, the more weight you tend to lose if you need to lose weight. Um, and then, of course, exercising is good for high blood pressure. Well, that helps with weight loss as well. Yeah, so a lot of these things cross over. Uh, step number 10, get good sunshine. Right? 
Um, it's remarkable how fast a sun bath can decrease blood pressure. So just getting out in the sun and bathing in the sun when somebody has high blood pressure. We've seen blood pressures come down 40 points in 20 minutes just with sunbathing. You know, so somebody's got high blood pressure, send them outside, stick them in a chair, let them bathe in the sun. And, uh, and in fact, one of our older physicians sometimes would go out there and measure blood pressures every five minutes and just monitor and see how the, how the blood pressures are coming down while somebody's out there in the sun. Of course, the sun is warm, um, and, uh, and there's a, a relaxing nature to, be in it, to being out there in the sun, and so there's some stress reduction that happens with it. Uh, sunlight in the eyes uh, converts tryptophan to serotonin. Serotonin is one of your, your uh, mood, uh, mood stabilizers, stabilizers, mood regulators in the, in the brain as well, and so it helps with mood, it can help with attitude. Uh, the warmth can cause vasodilation. There's many different uh, components of which, by, whereby which sunlight and sunbathing can help with reducing blood pressure. So make sure that you get out there in the sun. Step number 11, make sure you get good sleep. Okay. And we talked about insomnia and one of those ways that you can work on sleep. Uh, on our first welcome meeting on Sunday evening, uh, and that has to do with intercessory prayer, but yeah, make sure that you get good sleep or good rest. Okay. That could be prayer time with the Lord and that works as well. But we know, we see at the Lifestyle Center, if we have somebody that has blood pressures kind of in this range and then one day their blood pressures are poof, back up by 10, 20 points, 15 points or something. One of my first questions is, well, how did you sleep last night? And somebody would be like, oh, you know, I was tossing and turning and I, I had a bad night of sleep. Well, you can see it in the blood pressure the next morning. So when you're not sleeping well, blood pressure tends to elevate. Um, and uh, research shows that sleep deprivation also is a cause for uh, higher blood pressure. Changes how the brain responds to blood pressure signals. And uh, um, step number 12, deep breathing can be beneficial for high blood pressure. Uh, there's something that we call 479 breathing. It's a, it's a very simple activity, a very simple practice. And so um, we'll, we'll run through that right now for all of the sleeping ones and all of the wake ones. Um, and uh, and uh, a lot of you that didn't sleep well last night, I can tell. <coughs> and uh, all right, so four, seven, nine, breathe in. It's very easy. You breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, and you breathe out slowly for a count of nine. Then you breathe in for a count of four, you hold for seven, you breathe out for a count of nine, and then you keep repeating that. So uh, we're going to breathe out. All right, now in. Hold. Out, slowly, in, hold, out, in, hold, out, and so on, right? So you would continue doing that for about 10 times or a couple minutes, uh, just a couple minutes really of doing that deep breathing. And you can see blood pressure reductions of five points and up to 20 points within about two minutes of doing some deep breathing. Um, sometimes it's uh, more effective than others, other times it's less effective than others, but every time you can get the blood pressure, if you have high blood pressure, every time you can get that blood pressure down, even for a few minutes, it has a positive impact upon the system as a whole. Right? So every bit of time that we can get that blood pressure down some, um, even for short periods of time, and this only lasts for a short period of time, but every time that we can do so, that has a positive benefit, positive impact on the system as a whole. Step number 13, you want to reduce your environmental noise, right? Um, so if you have a lot of children, duct tape is beneficial. Um, <laughs> I 
I have a lot of children, and we haven't used duct tape yet, so um, I'm just kidding. Um, no, the studies, the studies have actually shown that the more environmental noise that you have, the higher the blood pressure is. Uh, one, of the, one of the studies was looking at individuals who live on a house that's on a busy street, and whether your bedroom is on the side of the building towards the street or whether it's on the side of the building towards the backyard. And if you are sleeping in the room that is on the side towards the busy street with all that environmental noise, blood pressures are higher on that side of the building than you are if you're sleeping on the back side. Right? So if you are in a, in a home or apartment or something like that that's on a street and they, you know, there's a bit of traffic and other things that are going along and you're concerned about your blood pressure and you don't have to raise somebody else's blood pressure, well, choose a room that's on the back side of the of the house rather than the one that's on the front side of the house. Uh, so environmental noise also has that impact upon uh, blood pressure as well. Step number 14, hydrotherapy, water treatments. There are certain things that you can do that kind of help with that blood pressure. Basically, when it comes to hydrotherapy, I mean, we don't have to get very fancy. All it is is warm or hot, <laughs> right? If it's warm or hot, uh, not too hot at the beginning, because if it's too hot at the beginning, then, then your initial response is higher blood pressure for the first minute to three minutes or so, and then it kind of goes down. Um, and so if the blood pressure is really high, then you start with warm. And if it's not really high, you can start with hot, that's okay. It can be a hot foot bath, it can be a hot hand bath, it can be a hot arm bath, it can be a hot leg bath, it can be a hot sits bath, it can be a hot bath bath. It doesn't matter. But that heat application to the body, heat causes the blood vessels to dilate, right? And the more dilation that you can get, then the less pressure that there is on the blood inside of those blood vessels. And so any kind of heat treatment is going to then result in a reduction of blood pressure uh, while you're in that treatment and for many of the treatments for an hour to a few hours afterwards, right? So uh, you can go stick your feet in hot water for 20 minutes. You can go have a hot or warm bath for 20 minutes or so on. All of those are going to help with reducing the blood pressure. And just ways that you can use water and temperature and so on to help out with that blood pressure on a short-term basis. And then finally, we want to eliminate stress. Right? Um, and how do we eliminate stress? That's for another month-long seminar, right? Um, and uh, if you want further resources for that, then um, Uchi Pines has a YouTube channel and we've got a lot of videos on there. A number of them are quite beneficial for uh, for stress reduction. Uh, one of them that I recommend that I'm biased about because it was one that I delivered. But anyways, it's, uh, it's called The Law of Life. And so you go on there on The Law of Life. There's one from 2016 that was a seven-part series, and then there's one from 2018 that's a 15-part series. Uh, but it helps to give you a perspective on life and things that happen uh, so that you're not stressed out about it. And you can, in the midst of all of it, you can see um, <clears throat> why everything is actually going uh, better than what you thought it was going. Um, but anyways, eliminating that stress, we know individuals that are dealing with, again, bitterness and anger and resentment and, and guilt and shame and loneliness and so on and so forth. All of these are different aspects that are associated with higher blood pressures. And when those issues are addressed and they're dealt with, and uh, resolved by the grace of God, and that resolution only comes through the gospel. Right? Uh, you try to bring this about through self-help techniques and, and, uh, and meditation and so on and so forth, it's not really going to be permanently effective. It's through the gospel. It's through the, the message that we have of God's grace and his mercy to us and his ability to not only forgive us, but to restore us. Right? And, uh, and through those messages of God's grace and his love and the gospel that he has for us, um, that really is our key to stress reduction and stress management and so on. So in summary, you can fast, eat a low salt diet, maintain a high potassium to sodium ratio, include blood pressure reducing foods like high fiber foods, blood pressure reducing supplements like L-arginine and and uh, CoQ10 and so on. Use blood pressure reducing herbs like your hibiscus and uh, olive leaf. Exercise on a regular basis. Avoid things like caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco. You wanna lose weight, get good sunshine, good sleep. Do your 479 breathing on a regular basis. Reduce your environmental noise. Use warm or hot hydrotherapy treatments and eliminate your stress. And when you do so, 
Life is good. <laughs> All right. Well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings and your good mercies to us. And uh, as we seek to apply the things that we are learning, we ask for your strength and your wisdom. And, and we thank you for uh, doing so. And um, we just ask for you to, to draw us close to you and bring about your healing in our lives as we cooperate with you in these laws of health. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.